We believe that peace is at hand. <clears throat> we believe that a, an agreement is within sight <clears throat> based on the May 8th uh, proposals of the President and some adaptations of our January 25th proposal, which is just to all parties. Dr. Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's special advisor, announces what looks like the end of the Vietnam War. With the basic settlement between the United States and North Vietnam now agreed, America could be approaching the end of the longest war in its history. Peace is apparently at the tip of a pen. The only outstanding problem is how to get the South Vietnamese government to accept the political conditions attached to the ceasefire. But the general feeling is that Washington may well go ahead with or without the blessing of Saigon. If peace it proves to be, it'll be the end of one of the most controversial conflicts in American history and the only war from which large numbers of the American people withdrew their support. Now that nearly all troops have returned home, there's time to consider how it all began. How did the world's most powerful country become so involved in a war that eventually sucked dry its economy, maimed its young men, and virtually tore apart the very soul of the nation? It began, of course, not with the Americans, but the French. French colonial rule in Indochina went back to 1860. The Japanese took over for a while in World War II, but in 1945, the French administration returned to Saigon, capital of what was then Cochin, China. But the Vietnamese nationalists who'd fought the Japanese had no wish to exchange one foreign master for another, and many of them now turned against the French. Many of the nationalists were also communists, led by a wispy bearded man who as early as 1930 had vowed to overthrow the French. His name was Ho Chi Minh, and in 1945, he set up his own illegal government in Hanoi. Ho's government didn't last long, and he soon fled to the hills, where he directed a guerrilla campaign against French troops. The Vietnam War had begun. The French overseas minister declared at the time there can be no political settlement before we get a military decision, a pronouncement that set the precedent for the next 25 years. Political developments, it seemed, could only be discussed once victory was achieved. It was a formula that ensured a long, drawn-out war. The French army found, as the Americans were to do later, that a large mechanized force was little use against mobile guerrillas who could strike quickly and then melt away into the jungle. Soon, 150,000 French troops were trying to keep down a rebel force of less than a quarter that number. Finally, in November 1953, the French gambled on smashing the communists in one big maneuver. 7,000 French paratroops were dropped into Dien Bien Phu, a stronghold in the north, in the hope of luring the communists into a pitched battle where they'd presumably be at a disadvantage. The communist commander, General Jap, accepted the challenge, and the French soon found themselves under an unrelenting siege. With military aid from China, the communists closed in on the beleaguered French, surrounding them and preventing them from reaching their own supplies. Dien Bien Phu saw some of the most heroic fighting of the French campaign in Indochina, but it wasn't enough to save the French cause. After six months of battle, deprivation and starvation, 
the paratroops finally surrendered on May the 7th, 1954. It was a psychological blow that shattered France's morale. Meanwhile, an international conference on Indochina had been arranged some months earlier, and by an ironic twist of fate actually opened a few days before the French defeat. The big four powers, plus China, South Vietnam, and the Viet Minh communists from the north were all represented. The French agreed to withdraw from Indochina, and the region was partitioned between two new states. The agreement provided for the temporary division of Vietnam at the 17th parallel. The north went to Ho's communists, Saigon to the South Vietnamese, and it was hoped both sides would unite in free elections within two years. Neither side was to accept military aid from other powers, nor allow foreign bases on its soil. And the neutrality of Laos and Cambodia was to be guaranteed. The United States bitterly opposed the settlement, and Secretary of State John Dulles actually described it as a defeat for American foreign policy. South Vietnam, too, dissociated itself from the final declaration of the conference. In South Vietnam, a new government was formed under Ngo Dinh Diem. Economic aid flowed in from the United States, but little progress was made on reforms which were supposed to make democracy more appealing to the South Vietnamese and thus bolster their opposition to the communists. American military support for Diem was limited to army advisers, of whom there were about 8,000 by the end of Eisenhower's term of office in 1960. <laughs> President Eisenhower had believed in the so-called domino theory, that if South Vietnam fell, other countries in Southeast Asia would inevitably follow. And when President Kennedy came to office, he too felt the need to reaffirm America's commitment. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Meanwhile, in Vietnam, the domestic situation was worsening. Opposition to Diem's oppressive and corrupt rule was expressed in Buddhist riots in Saigon. Diem imposed martial law, but the unrest continued. The president and his family became the most hated people in the land, and by the summer of 1963, the situation was so bad that even the Americans agreed that Diem had to go. He was overthrown and killed in November 1963 and replaced by a military junta. It was the first of a series of coups that plunged South Vietnam into political chaos. Three weeks later, President Kennedy himself was murdered in Dallas. It was Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, who was to commit America to shouldering the burden that had so crippled the French. The fateful decision came in August 1964, after two American destroyers were fired on in the Gulf of Tonkin off the North Vietnamese coast. LBJ immediately asked Congress to sanction any steps necessary to counter communist aggression. It did so almost unanimously. And it was this approval, the so-called Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, that Johnson used to justify America's ever-deepening involvement in Vietnam. But America's real agony still lay in the future, and in the 1964 presidential elections, LBJ actually campaigned as a peace candidate against a headstrong Republican contender, Barry Goldwater. He won by a landslide. But in Vietnam itself, the war was going badly. The North Vietnamese poured supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail through Laos into Cambodia. 
From there, they were passed on to both regular North Vietnamese soldiers and the Viet Cong, South Vietnamese communists who believed themselves to be fighting a civil war of national liberation. These men, surprised that they encountered decent treatment instead of the expected brutality, they proved more than a match for the South Vietnamese army, despite its reliance on American air support. More U.S. advisors were sent to Vietnam. By the middle of 1965, they numbered about 50,000. In May 1965, William Westmoreland, the U.S. commander in Vietnam, reported that more troops were needed. LBJ gave him permission to use U.S. forces in combat roles to support the Vietnamese. The 1st Marines came ashore at Da Nang Beach, and within a year, over 200,000 American troops had been committed directly to the struggle. Their role was to win a military victory from which would flow a favorable political settlement. The same mistakes that the French had made 15 years earlier were being repeated, only this time on a much larger scale. It wasn't long before the largest mechanized army Southeast Asia had ever seen was bogged down in the jungles of South Vietnam. In the air, the Americans bombed the North to prevent the communists getting supplies through. Thousands of tons of explosives rained down from giant B-52s. The targets were military, but such intensive bombardment inevitably claimed many civilian casualties. Between 1965 and 1968, American troop strength rose to over half a million. Fleets of helicopters were brought in to form new air cavalry regiments, which it was hoped would cancel out the communists' superior ability on the ground. Even with massive air support, the Americans found the going tough. In the early days especially, they complained about the sort of help they were getting from their South Vietnamese counterparts. Lack of local knowledge and poor intelligence often meant that search and destroy operations ended disastrously in communist ambushes. American morale, never very high, dropped alarmingly as the casualties piled up. In these search-and-destroy operations, the South Vietnamese suffered almost as much as the communists. In an attempt to flush out suspected Viet Cong areas, whole villages were destroyed, and their wretched inhabitants, if they survived at all, joined the growing ranks of refugees. For many villagers, it seemed that being defended by the Americans was as much of an ordeal as being attacked by the communists. But despite these setbacks, the American leadership retained its faith in a military rather than a political solution we to the war. They refused ourselves. to believe that a nation as powerful as the United the States Vietnam. could ever be, be frustrated by such a small country. adversary. In President Johnson way. put it like this. I wish it were possible to convince others with words of what we now find it necessary to say with guns and planes. Armed hostility is futile. Our resources are equal to any challenge. 
Once this is clear, then it should also be clear that the only path for a reasonable man is the path of peaceful settlement. As the war gained in intensity, American casualties mounted. And these were not just neutral statistics released by the US High Command in Saigon. Blanket coverage of the war by television crews meant every groan of the injured was recorded. Scenes like these inside a U.S. field hospital reached American television screens with sickening frequency. The TV coverage and the obvious pounding that North Vietnam was absorbing from the continuous bombing missions led to doubt and self-questioning among people back home. Students especially began to analyze their country's role in Vietnam, and many began to see the conflict as a civil war in which America should have no part. An anti-war movement began on the campuses and eventually spread across the nation until demonstrations outside the Capitol, White House or the Pentagon were almost weekly occurrences. Dissent was not confined to the young. In the American Senate, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator William Fulbright, called government leaders such as Secretary of State Dean Rusk to account for America's conduct of the war. Fulbright wanted to know what self-interest America was defending in such a small country so far away from home. He asked, was it worth it? Can we afford the horrors which are being inflicted on the people of a poor and backward land? to say nothing of our own people. Can we afford the alienation of our allies, the neglect of our own deep domestic problems, and the disillusionment of our youth? Can we afford the loss of confidence in our government and institution, the fading of hope and optimism, and the betrayal of our traditional values? We have undertaken not the task of the world policemen, but we have undertaken certain aspects of it. Uh, we have, uh, over the years, under the Truman and Eisenhower administration concluded certain treaties. Those were approved by overwhelming bipartisan majorities in the Senate. And those treaties call upon us to take action when certain things happen. In the case of Southeast Asia, if there's an aggression by armed attack, to take steps to meet the common danger. I don't know what would happen to the peace of the world if it should be discovered that our treaties do not mean anything. At the beginning of 1968, the communists launched what they called the long-awaited general offensive to overthrow the Saigon regime. In most areas, the attackers were soon repulsed, but fighting in Hue and Saigon continued for three weeks. Communist losses were enormous, but Americans back home were shattered to see how far they were from the long-promised military victory. These setbacks had further political effects in America. In election year, peace candidates like Eugene McCarthy enjoyed resounding victories in the primary campaigns. President Johnson himself announced he wouldn't stand again, but would devote the rest of his term of office to seeking a peace formula. The bombing was halted and the North Vietnamese were invited to peace talks in Paris. Preparations for the talks took months and produced few constructive suggestions. For several weeks, the negotiators actually argued about the shape of the table, and the first plenary session didn't open until February 1969. By that time, Richard Nixon was in the White House, carried there by his promise to the American electorate to end the war and win the peace. Within six months, he'd announced the first troop withdrawals, 
and in the next three years, half a million American soldiers returned home. Nixon's policy was to get the South Vietnamese themselves to do the fighting, with America only committed to air support. Vietnamization was the goal, but it could only be achieved if South Vietnam's army was given enough time to train and equip. To ensure this, President Nixon ordered American forces into Cambodia in May 1970 to seek out and destroy communist sanctuaries. It was the last big operation in which US troops played a combat role. Washington claimed the operation had been a complete success, but more objective observers were less enthusiastic. It did, however, slow down supplies to the Viet Cong. It wasn't until last year that South Vietnam's army was put to a major test on its own, and it failed disastrously when it tried to cut communist supply lines in Laos. And early this year, the communists proved yet again that they could still hit the South hard when they launched an offensive that threatened road links to Saigon and took communist troops into the northern city of Quang Tri. It took months of bitter fighting by South Vietnamese Marines to retake the city. By the time they did, it was just a mass of rubble. Meanwhile, peace moves were making some progress, largely through the efforts of Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's special advisor, who carried on a series of secret meetings with the North Vietnamese at which the ceasefire agreement gradually took shape. American prisoners of war held in North Vietnam were to be released when the fighting stopped, on condition that the Americans agreed to a three-part coalition government in the South, made up of communists, anti-communists and neutralists. It's these political conditions that have yet to be accepted by President Thieu's government in Saigon. They would probably mean the end of Thieu as the South's leader, and to most observers, they also imply that the Americans have reluctantly accepted that South Vietnam will eventually be controlled by the communists. It's this implication that President Thieu finds difficult to swallow, and he's described the agreement as a sellout. The conflict, which has torn Vietnam apart over the last two decades, has ultimately been a battle for the hearts and minds of people like these, the ordinary Vietnamese peasants, who are, for the most part, completely indifferent to political ideologies. After more than a quarter of a century of fighting, they've seen a whole generation grow up knowing nothing but war. A settlement will no doubt bring other problems but it will at least give them a chance to fulfill their main ambition, which is, and always has been, to grow and harvest their crops in peace. <laughs>